Okay, we've begun our recording, so welcome uh, to our first online streaming class, uh, Walking with Hanshan. I'm so glad that so many of you decided to um, take advantage of this opportunity because it, it does several things aside from whatever um, benefit that you might receive, which I hope is considerable. It also is a wonderful way for me to connect with everyone, which, which I really appreciate. And there are many of you uh, that I see on the screen right now with whom I connect in a practice discussion group regularly, or uh, with whom I have individual practice discussion sessions in the same way. But it's good to bring us all together. Uh, it looks like all the little squares on an Ocasa um, robe, all the squares that are patched together, it's really beautiful. I think we probably won't take uh, time today to do any kind of extended sitting so we can um, begin our walk together. But just for a moment, just listen to the bells. It's good to start with nine bells. So as you know, <clears throat> in recommending that we use this as our guide, a beautiful collection of newly translated poems by Kaz Tanahashi and Peter Levitt. It's the first full collection of the poems of Hanshan or Cold Mountain. There are uh, many translations that have uh, come about over the years, and no doubt some of you are quite familiar with Hanshan's poetry. Um, I know uh, those of you that have studied these kind of things have come across his poetry. Peg sent me some uh, some things today, and even some uh, a poem that she had written in response to Hanshan's work. But this is, a, I think, a unique uh, collection, and I thought it might be um, a good map for us to use to walk together. And I use that imagery of walking together um, because I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are, are familiar with what it's like to go for a walk with a friend, um, maybe to go for a hike, but even less strenuously, just a beautiful casual walk with a friend. And there are things that you notice that you wouldn't notice otherwise. Um, and so this is a, a way of walking um, together to see what we might discover if we do so. I'm not gonna begin with um, an enormous amount of history or background, I'm gonna give you just a little bit. Um, and I'm also gonna make sure I have my timer set here appropriately, pardon me. So I can be respectful of our time. Uh, 
I will say that the person to whom these poems are attributed, Hanshan or Cold Mountain, and by the way, Hanshan means Cold Mountain. Um, it was the name of the place in which this person supposedly was a hermit, and he took on the name of that place, as many hermits did. Um, and there are a few of these poems that by their form and their content, uh, it seems clear from the scholarly work that they were written between the sixth and seventh century. And that's section one in the book. And you'll see in here that there are three sections which we'll be going through. Uh, this time and next time, primarily section one, but then we'll go through the other two. Um, and Kaz has done a nice job in a, uh, a chapter in the, the very back of the, the collection, talking about the history of Han Chan and who he thought he was. These first poems were written between the sixth and seventh century. The second group are more explicitly Buddhist and were written supposedly between the seventh and eighth century and the last section between the 8th and ninth century. You might say, well, now wait a minute, that's over 200 years. <laughs> so this guy was really old, or it wasn't actually one person. So it's, it's, um, it's very probable that Hanshan wasn't one person. There are, quote, three Hanshans, um, or at least three periods in which these these poems seem to unfold in the mountains of China between the sixth and the early part of the ninth century. So that gives us a little bit of a um, situation of where we are. What I'd like to do is just dive right in and I'm going to be um, indicating which poem we'll be referencing at various points. And if you'll notice in the book, they all have a number. It's quite easy um, to find which one we're, we're looking at. If you don't have the book yet or don't have it at all, then just listen and receive uh, what comes. You don't have to necessarily uh, follow along inside. And rather than try to explain or give some intellectual orientation uh, to the poetry, I'd rather step onto the path and begin to let it unfold as we walk together. That seem okay? And by the way, with this kind of format, obviously it's a little more complex uh, for discussion. Um, but I'm sure there are moments in which you will absolutely not be able to help yourself. And, and good, that you really want to say something or make a comment. And if you do, wave at me. There are a whole lot of squares, so I might miss you. Uh, and if I miss you, unmute yourself and say, hello, <laughs> I'm trying to get your attention. It's totally fine. It's just really good that we don't, we're not all on the microphones at the same time because we get an amazing amount of sound that comes through from all these different uh, systems. Does that seem okay also? So let me know if, uh, if you want my attention and if you want to say something, make a comment, ask a question. Um, and it may be even a little harder with the group in the Zendo um, only because you're tiny for me. So, uh, but I know that um, <clears throat> that you'll make sure you stand up or wave at me or something so that I can uh, can hear you or see you. And so any uh, anybody want to get my attention right off the bat is to ask a question about something or what we're about to launch into. Or, or is everybody ready to uh, hold hands and step onto the path? Okay, great. Why don't we start at the beginning? Poem number one. And by the way, I hope that 
everyone received my email, which suggested uh, what you might read early on and some of the things you might reference. And you don't, you don't have to have read them. Uh, and let me see a show of hands. Did anyone listen to the podcast that Peter Levitt gave at Upaya? Several people did. I thought, I mean, I love Peter. He's such a great friend. Peg and I, uh, really close to him. And it's lovely to hear his voice and knowing that he was one of the translators. But it was also spectacular to hear the native Chinese speaker read the poems and to hear uh, Peter say, maybe this is what they sounded like in Han Chan's own mind. And so if you're curious, you might go back and, uh, and listen uh, to that podcast because it's really, it's really lovely. The first poem, you ask the way to Cold Mountain, but the road does not go through. In summer, the ice is not yet melted. The morning sun remains hidden in the mist. How can you get there like I did? Our minds are not the same. When your mind becomes like mine, You'll get here too. As we enter, I think I certainly held a question. The, the ordinary question is who is Anshan? What, uh, where is Cold Mountain? Who was he or she? We don't actually know. What is the mind, this mind, where he says, your mind becomes like mine? What is this mind? And what is meant by your mind will become like mine? Your mind will become like mine. I found it really powerful to hear Peter say, you know, Han Shan was not someone living somewhere doing something. And that's what we tend to do is collapse um, an identity into a person living somewhere, doing something. But these poems invite us to walk with him in the landscape in which he lived. And they invite us to do something that is really, I think, quite spectacular. And this is not my phrase that I'm going to say, but I, I found it uh, beautiful. He said, Han Chan's poems invite us to walk with him and to live like him as the totality of existence. To walk with him and to live like him as the totality of existence. Isn't that a beautiful line? What would that mean to live as the totality of existence? It calls to my mind the line we chant so frequently, caught in the self-centered dream, holding to self-centered thoughts. That's not living in the total as the totality of existence. But at the end of our four practice principles, when it says being just this moment, there's a pointer to the totality of existence. And in between, there's that beautiful line that says each moment life as it is, the only teacher. So we're invited on a pilgrimage when we engage the poems to face our willingness for the spiritual risk and renewal. Have any of you ever gone on a hike or a walk that you thought when you began, you know, this is maybe just a little bit or a lot, but let's just say just a little bit beyond my ability or capacity. There are times when I lived in Colorado where I would, I was going to go on a walk with someone in the mountains and I'd think, oh man, I don't know. This is, this might be a little too much for me. Have you ever done that? I see some head shaking. Or, you know, I'm not quite sure where we're going. I think I do, but 
Let, let's see how it goes. Because we're invited on the pilgrimage to face our willingness. I, I really think, and I can imagine, um, even though I can't see it very well, I can imagine this is one of those moments after so many years of teaching with Peg that when I say this, she'll be shaking her head like this. You know? and I love that when we teach together. We say, oh yeah. That this, um, this pilgrimage of facing our willingness for spiritual risk and renewal is what we do every single time we step over the threshold into the zendo with our foot away from the altar. And we do it in a ceremonial way. We do it in a specific way, in a mindful way. To let us know we're not just bursting into a room when we're coming into sit zazen. We're taking a risk. And we're entering a space of pilgrimage where we're going to face our willingness for confrontation and for renewal. That possibility. Does that seem okay, Peg? Great. So how do we come to terms? with the slowly dawning apprehension of this vulnerable body and a brief life, the slowly dawning apprehension that such a vulnerable body is such a brief life is a full and inconceivable expression of the totality of existence. This is it. This is how it shows up. Or this is the road. This is the path. Having a body, having an impermanent body, knowing that you have a brief life. And this is the full, the complete, and inconceivable expression of the totality of existence. You're living it out. Not knowing exactly where it will go, although we kind of act like we do most of the time because it gives us great comfort to assume we do. But just like our great friend Robin Riso in the last couple of weeks, we could go to bed and not wake up unexpectedly. This is the road. This is the path. And in our first poem, when he says the road does not go through. You ask the way to Cold Mountain, but the road does not go through. I, I don't think he's saying you can't get there, but there isn't an easy access. The road that you think is the road, the path that you think is the path, is not the one that's going to get you all the way there. But unless you step on the path, you won't discover the one that will. We have had ideas about spiritual practice, certainly about things we call meditation or study of, um, of Buddhism. And we think, oh, here's the path. This is the one I'm going to get on and it'll take me, it'll take me there. Until we get on it and begin to explore it a little more fully. And then it's like, wait a minute. I'm not sure this is what I bargained for. This is not how I thought it might, it might go. There are barriers and challenges in practice that we encounter on our way to finding our way home. You know, when we take those um, pathways into the forest or the mountains or the desert or the beach where we go, going out is not a problem usually. It's turning around and going, uh, how do I get back? That's usually the one. How do we come home, deeply home? The road does not go through. The ice is not yet melted, even in the summer. Sometimes I've felt that way when I go to Madison. Usually it's melted by the summer. <laughs> but when I go in the spring, sometimes the lakes are still frozen. <clears throat> but in this case, I thought, you know, conditioning is really strong. Habits deeply entrenched to protections fully in place to ward off pain, of vulnerable exiles. Sometimes even in the summer, even when we're warmly held in our practice, not everything is melted, has it? Did you notice? There are things that still require a bit of melting. 
The morning sun remains hidden in the mist, he says. The light of awakening may be hidden, but it's not gone, it's just obscured by ignorance. The light of awakening is blazing fully and freely, just like the sun, if we can only penetrate the mist of delusion. The window out of which I'm looking through the blinds, there's a valley below me and then a ridge across the way. And the sun is really warm and bright today. It's still that end of summer, early September, I'm sure that most of the places that um, you are, you still have that kind of sunshine. But I just noticed the clouds starting to roll over the top of the ridge. And so now the, the sun is a bit obscured. And this is how it is sometimes in our mind, in our hearts, of course. <clears throat> How can you get here like I did? The next line. As I was thinking about that, my, my first question was, who is this I? How, did, how can you get here like I did? It could be, of course, the poet speaking, but this is the key question, isn't it? How do I discover or open to, or sometimes we think each state of wakefulness and peace and clear mind and a generous heart. How do we get here? And then when your mind becomes like mine, we get here too. Now we know in the Zen tradition, we talk about transmission as mind-to-mind -mind transmission, that the teachings are offered warm hand to warm hand. Zen is said to be a teaching outside of the scriptures, beyond words and letters. It's something that's transmitted. And that's, that's kind of a formal, in some ways, beautiful but fussy Zen way we, we talk about it. But for all of us, on a screen, on a computer, here, now, it's more everyday and a little more ordinary. When your mind becomes like mine, when I can, as best I can, soften every barrier that I have between me and you, and there are no parts in the way, and not, not too much is exiled at least, when I begin to realize, oh, your mind is like my mind, not the same mind, that our fundamental basic sanity and goodness is the same thing, but it gets expressed like Kim or Joel or Sarah or Cassie or Tess or Anne or Vivek, it, it just gets expressed in all these ways. But without me and you trying to fit some mold, that's shattered. And we find how we resonate, how we can be intimate. When your mind becomes like mine, when there isn't a separation, we'll get there together. The line says, you'll get here too. When we really know each other and accept each other. I was working with a student recently and this student said, it would really help me as I'm exploring the further reaches of these I don't even know what you call it, uh, spaces of consciousness and groundlessness. The student said, would you just say what I say, I'm here. This person wanted me to say those words, I'm here, I'm here. And I said later on, without thinking about it, I said, I'm with you. And the person said, oh no. I said, oh, I thought I was saying the same thing. And this person said, no, if you're with me, we're in trouble. I don't need to hear I'm with you. I need you to, hear, to say, I'm here. And so there's some tricky business about that sometime, but I hope you get a sense of 
<clears throat> when your mind becomes like mine, you'll get here too. Sometimes we need a sense of confidence. It doesn't have to come from a teacher. This isn't about Hanshan is way out there and he's achieved everything. And someday, maybe if you're a good student, you'll get there. I, I don't think that's what he's saying. You ask the way to Cole Mountain, but the road doesn't go through. The way you have set out, the way you've prescribed, your own little personal path is not the one that's going to get you there. You can get there, but not by your own egoistic endeavors. There are things that haven't melted yet. They're in the way. There are things that get obscured because of ignorance. So how do we get here? When our minds are the same, when we're not separate, when we connect and care for each other and wake up to that, that sense of one mind, one heart, one body. He's giving a, us a hint, I think, about this mind, which is beyond ordinary consciousness and yet it's only expressed and lived as ordinary consciousness. It was, I'm going to mention one old koan here and then I'm um, going to ask you, um, see if you have any questions, but Daibi asked Basho, in one of the old koan stories, what is Buddha? And Basho said famously, this mind is Buddha. This mind is Buddha. What is Buddha? This mind is Buddha. So this very mind is Buddha is sometimes translated describes in a simple and, you know, unadorned, not fancy, unadorned way, the highest possibility that a human life affords. But this very mind could be Buddha. We already possess, you already possess, I already possess, we already possess this immense treasure. Wouldn't it be great to know it and appreciate it? and see it in everyone, to express it, to embody it, and to see it wherever we look. This very mind is Buddha. Later on in those stories, another monk asked Basho, who had said, this very mind is Buddha, the same question, what is Buddha? You know, and by that time, maybe like the other story had gotten around and everybody knew it or something, so he decided to throw in a different answer. And Basho said, not mind, not Buddha. Those old Zen guys were always trying to pull the rug out, you know. So word got back to Tybee, the original questioner that said, what is Buddha? And Basho had said, this very mind is Buddha. Word got back to him because he'd gone to another monastery that um, he had answered the second monk by saying, not mine, not Buddha. I don't think it was on Twitter. But, and he said, Tybee, the original questioner said, I don't care what the old guy says. As far as I'm concerned, it's still, this mind is Buddha. He said, I like that answer. I'm sticking with it. Now, then Basho heard this that Tybee had said this, and his response, he claimed, ah, the great plum has finally ripened. Now, Tybee means great plum. So he was saying, oh, Tybee finally ripened. So what did he mean that his student had ripened? Because he told him one thing. He went away, was teaching. The student who was entrusted heard a different answer. And he said, I don't care what the old guy says. He may have changed his tune, but I still like this very mind is Buddha. And the teacher goes, ah, he's finally matured. It's important to make use of the truth that we come to know, of course. But we have to make them our own. Otherwise, they're just something that I said or, you know, Peg said or Joan has said in her uh, mature wisdom. If we're not willing to try things out on our own, 
to have our views smashed and transformed, then what are we doing all this for in the first place? If we think we have the answer and we know it, that's a problem. If we're willing to have things challenged and mixed up, that's a possibility. But also, if we find something that makes sense to us and speaks to us deeply, we also have to have confidence. Confidence is not, is not a way of standing against humility, the kind of confidence I'm talking about. It's not arrogance. It's not um, stuckness. It's the kind of confidence that says, I can move as I need to move. I can be free. I'm not caught. And yet I have confidence in where I'm standing. One of the, uh, the most senior students, I would say, just by, by practice in, is in Madison, is Suzanne Kilkos. He was our first kid student. And she's been a teacher. And by the way, those of you that don't know, Kim Michelle, who's on with us tonight, is our second head student in Madison. And um, Suzanne recently returned from um, a retreat. I don't think she'd mind my saying we just talked today. And uh, a Qigong retreat with um, a Chinese master. And, and Suzanne has a lot of practice, including body practices, but she also has um, a very labile form of bone marrow cancer that could be to turn into an acute leukemia. She's doing well. But she talked about this uh, Chinese teacher talking about confidence. And it rang true to what I was uh, reading here. He said, you have to have confidence, not arrogance. Confidence in, and now I'll say in one's own nature, in Buddha nature. And what's, what's deep? That's what we're pointing to in Cole Mount. <clears throat> so before we go on, we've just looked at this one point. Is there anyone that wants to make a comment or ask a question or just say something about this first poem? Which we get, you can make a whole retreat from this one poem, right? It's beautiful. Yes, somebody who, was that you, Joel? No? Um, oh, I thought I was on mute. No. I, was, I, I I just was reawakening my iPad so I could read the poem. Ah, okay. okay. I don't have a comment. Okay. Anyone? Just checking. Otherwise, I'll go on, and I'm sure I don't want you to go to sleep listening to me. Is it going okay? As we start our way down the road, okay. You know, we've. I think we have to come to terms with the fact that This existence is an amazing and generous gift. If you can't come to terms with the fact that this existence is an amazing and generous gift, then you're missing something. Now, right alongside that knowing, you might bitch and moan about a whole lot of things. <laughs> Was that a yes? Thumbs up, Sally? I couldn't tell. <laughs> yeah. There may, it doesn't mean that you're all happy all the time or you put on a smiley face. That's not the point at all. But if you can accept with some confidence, and here's where the confidence comes in, that existence is an amazing and generous gift, then there is the space and ground from which you can meet that which feels nothing like amazing or generous. And this gift is filled with the most incredible things, uh, people, experiences. But in order for it to become embodied, it can't remain an abstract concept. Like we have these ideas, oh, isn't this great? Isn't life beautiful? Isn't awakening the most beautiful uh, potential goal? No, it has to be personal. And it usually unfolds, this realization, with someone with whom you have walked through some important part of your life. This is the reason for Sangha and teachers and spiritual friends, for large Dobermans, for your friends or your horses, for, um, for anyone who walks with you, 
It's really, it's really the function of Sangha. And I'd like for you before next class, if you will, to think of someone who has been one of those people for you. Now, it may be an actual person. I'm going to read you something in a moment that I, I, I did the exercise I'm asking you to do, and I'm going to read you what I did, what I wrote. I chose my grandfather. could be someone like that. It could be, literally, it could be an, an animal that you were so close to, they guided you somewhere. It could have been um, a teacher. It could have been a friend. It could have been a fictional character that you uh, related to in such a profound way that your life has changed. That, that's not a concern of mine. <clears throat> Here's an example from my life. So I'm going to uh, read just a couple paragraphs. Is that okay? The name that most people do not know is mine is Thomas. That's my first name. It was my maternal grandfather's name, Thomas, or more commonly, Tom. His last name was Perry. They called, her, called him Tom Perry, or a lot of people in the small town in Texas called him Mr. Tom. <clears throat> I was named after him because he was revered by my mother, who was his daughter, son. She functioned in that way for him. And my father, who appreciated his maturity and integrity, unlike his own father. Tom Perry was a good man. A sidebar, I just thought we actually come from the same lineage as Commodore Perry, for which I think the Perry estate in Austin is named. Isn't that true? I'm not sure. Right there next to Alpamata. My grandfather loved me dearly and took me everywhere with him when I was small. He was a rural mailman in Caldwell County, Texas delivering mail out of the main mail uh, post office in Luling, a small, a small oil producing and agricultural town 45 miles south of Austin. He would take me on his mail route through the countryside, delivering to the families on small farms, living a simple rural life. We would stop at places my grandfather leased in order to raise his cattle. He loved ranching, but he couldn't do it full time, so he leased these properties, his little bits of ranch land. And we would sometimes leave the dusty roads and head out directly across the pastures, bumping along, and I would stand in the seat of the pickup so I could see, I'm less than four years old at this time, held up by his right shoulder. You know, there's no seat belts in those days. We bounced across the fields trying to locate the newly born calf or to make sure it was okay or to determine that the mother had survived the delivery well. Along the way, we would feed the other cattle who would come running to the pickup when they heard it. We stopped by streams and ate the lunch my grandmother had packed for us. I walked with him, holding his large leathered hand I was his tiny companion looking up to him, literally and figuratively, swimming through the tall, abrasive clutches of Johnson grass, between the stands of oaks, dodging the patches of prickly pear cactus and thorny mesquite trees, watching for snakes and enjoying the birds and bugs of the central Texas landscape. This was a kind of boyhood heaven, walking with Tom Perry. This is how I took him in and learned about my namesake. One day, I was home with my grandmother, and we got a call on the old black rotary phone. One of the families whose land he leased was calling, saying we needed to come pick him up because Mr. Tom was not feeling well. I was four or five years old, 
And I remember how weak he seemed when we arrived and got him off the tractor and into my grandmother's big black Buick. He was sweating and my grandmother was scared even though she would never show it. We got him to the doctor, I suppose, and he seemed okay. No one told me much, but I heard later that he'd had a heart attack. He lived only another couple of years before another heart attack killed him. It was a big loss for our family and a confusing loss for me. I wasn't to go to the funeral because I was so young, but I asked my mother to take me to the church before the funeral service, before all the people arrived. I wanted to see him in the coffin. She wasn't so sure this was a good idea, but I wanted to do it, so she let me. Just the two of us walking down the empty aisles to the front of Central Baptist Church, our family church. I was about to start first grade and Tom Perry was gone. Sort of. What part of his mind had I taken in? What had been transmitted? What remains today? There is another poem that I think I've forgotten to put here that's important. Number seven. My mind is like an autumn moon, glowing purely in a clear blue abyss. Nothing compares to it. What could I possibly say? My mind is like an autumn moon glowing in the, glowing purely in a clear blue abyss. His eyes, my grandfather's eyes were like clear blue space. And when he looked at me, I began to learn about love. I believed what I saw expressed in his eyes long before I had the capacity to think much about who or what I was. I was seen and I could feel this in my body. He'd showed me the world through his eyes, both in the way he looked at me and what he showed me in those formative years. In the poem, it says, nothing compares to it. What could I possibly say? How do you say what happened? Well, you don't really, you live it as best you can and it lives on, in, and as you. So this is an example I just wanted to give of what I'd like for you to do, is do some writing about someone you've walked with. It doesn't have to be a literal walk. That has shaped you. That has helped your mind become like theirs, or helped you open your mind, or become more than you thought you might be or shape the possibility that you now see being expressed in your life. This is how we're gonna walk with Hanshan anyway. You know, it's, it's easy to read the poems and to read um, critical analysis, to make um, discriminations, to make distinctions, to debate the meaning of the poems. Uh, we can challenge his conclusions or his teachings we can look for a place to stand with him. Um, but none of this is walking with Hanshan. None of that's walking with. 
that stepping back and thinking about. Burton Watson, who is a well-known translator, in fact, some of you who took the class with me on um, Vimalakirti, we used the Burton Watson translation of the sutra. We used Joan Sutherland's commentary, but the translation was Burton Watson. This is what he says. If the reader wishes to know the biography of Hanshan, they must deduce it from the poems themselves. So in a way, this can't actually be a regular class in which uh, some content is offered. The poems are an invitation along the way, and more important than the poems themselves are what they call forward in us and among us. This is the way to walk to Pole Mountain. This is what Uchiyama Roshi used to call the scenery of our lives. This is what comes forward in practice. And as we read the poems and follow Han Shan in reading them, we recognize something about the poet, but if we're awake and attentive, we'll recognize something about ourselves. This walking, the recognition, the capacity to attend in each moment and appreciate our life all point to this mind, which is being passed along. It's what Peter Levitt calls Han Shan mind. That's what's being passed along. And this can't be taught, but it can be transmitted. And this is the model of Zen transmission, which is so close to us these days, both in Austin and our sister Sanghas, as we approach the entrustment of a new teacher. Poem two, take a look. Lynn? Yes. I'd like to make a comment. Please. Can you see? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, Monica. Okay, so on poem one, poem, I'm saying it like you, I say poem one, something that we, sticks out right away when you're talking about it and when I look at it is, it's smack dab about a rela relationship or it, like you were saying how important Sangha is. It's, it's, a, it's not him talking about his life and what happened and things that happened that he was enlightened I don't, whoever put this first, this is all, it's about relationship and um, leading the way and transmission like what you're talking about. And I just think it's beautiful. That's what's the first point here is, you know, it's about how our mind could become like his. It's not just him talking about his experience. Mm -hmm. I think that's Yeah. And that's also why I entitled the class Walking With. Uh, because it's about how we connect. I also very personally thought that it was important because how do I sustain my relationship with all of you over all of this space and time and distance? And how do we reach out across all this time and distance to be with each other? and to remain connected, whether those of you in, in Austin or Madison, in San Antonio, in uh, out near the Pernalis River, all of you all over, those who are gonna listen to this in England, all the way from the South in Sussex to the North in Lancaster, to Sheffield, uh, Sophie will be listening in Switzerland. How do I bridge that gap? How do we keep the thread of connection among all of us? But thank you for just underscoring that. It's also why I 
used an example of some very intimate relationship that I had and why I'm asking you to reflect on those intimate relationships that you had um, so that it, these kind of things can come alive. Otherwise, they're interesting old points. It may be beautiful and instructive in some way, but how is it going to live in you? How is Han Shan mind going to wake up in you? Should we go to poem two? Okay. Um, <clears throat> we ask a question, if you don't mind my doing so. Um, do you have the book, Kim? Michelle? Do you? Mm -hmm. um, just because I've been, do you mind reading number two? You have to unmute yourself. There you go. That way, people in okay. Austin, people in Austin get to hear you. They hardly ever hear you. I was going to say about the comment about Sangha is I love seeing all of these people because <laughs> I know a lot of you because I listen to the Appamata podcast, so I actually know you quite well. <laughs> and you've heard them speak in inquiry too. Yeah. That's right. So I recognize like Kim and Joel's voice and yeah, like, it's, it's very fun actually. Yeah. yeah. So as one of our uh, recent yeah. students, uh, we'll hear Kim's voice. And by the way, I heard you gave a beautiful talk this past week. Go right ahead. Number two, no matter how high you climb cold mountain road, the way to cold mountain never ends. The long valley is stacked with boulders, its shoreline wet with lush grass. Slippery moss, regardless of rain, pine trees singing even without wind. Who can go beyond the entangled world to sit with me in the midst of white clouds? What does it call up immediately for you? Any lines strike you? Who can go beyond the entangled world? Yeah. And thank you. That's actually the line that Peter Levitt pulls out in his introduction, too, because that's the key to Han Chan's uh, teaching. This practice, uh, it says, no matter how high you climb Cold Mountain Road, the way never ends. The practice of intimacy never ends. The road doesn't have an ending. No matter how far you appear to, to go, opportunities for penetrating the great mystery of life and death never end. If it did, we could practice and do one retreat and then we'd be finished, you know? Great, done. But it doesn't end. Even when you can make no sense of it, it's sometimes necessary, like it was for me as a little boy, to look into the coffin. The demand that I walk all the way and look, to see the body, to know for sure that I see it, that this is it. Is there any more comment you wanted to make about that? Okay, thank you. Slippery marks, regardless of rain, pine trees singing even without wind. The life that we're all living and the one we're hoping to live is always here despite conditions. Your own true nature is always here. Suzuki Roshi would say, on your side. It's always on your side despite whether you practice it or not, which means you might realize it or not, that it's always on your side. But to feel the slippery moss, regardless of rain, to hear the pine trees singing, even without wind, for that, practice is necessary. And this is Han Shan's invitation. This is why we're walking with them and with each other. Mm. 
who can go beyond the entangled world to sit with me in the midst of white clouds. On Sunday, I flew over to Honolulu to be with a young pair of teachers, uh, Craig and Devin Hayes, H-A-S-E, who have, um, Craig is finishing his PhD at UW, Madison. Uh, worked with Richard Davidson and a number of people. And uh, Devin is a student um, of Sharon Salzberg and uh, Joseph Goldstein and that uh, group of Vipassana teachers. And they <coughs> practice really quite a bit. Uh, Craig spent seven, six years in the monastery at Crestone with uh, Baker Roshi. And so they, they practice quite a bit. And Craig was just finishing his internship for his PhD, which he did here in Hawaii. And uh, Devin has been traveling and teaching. So they were leaving and they're going to go to Japan from here. Um, they've sold their car and given up most of their stuff. And they're going on a pilgrimage. And uh, so they wanted to shave their heads and get ready for this pilgrimage in a more formal way. So I went over to help them do this. I said, you shouldn't just like, you know, shave it in the bathroom. Come on, let's have a ceremony. So we did a more formal ceremony to launch them on their way. Uh, and I sent them this poem also. Because the question that both of them were struggling with, especially Craig, was how to practice with as much devotion and fidelity as they do, and yet not get caught by forms, structures, and hierarchies, and politics, and keep the practice alive, no matter how, how you climb, the way never ends. And I also sent them a poem, which many of you are quite familiar with, uh, which I'll read and I'll send to you in an email so you'll have it, which is No Past by David White. And David White starts that poem by saying, there is no path that goes all the way. And he credits Hanshan is his poem to Hanshan. There is no path that goes all the way, Hanshan. And he continues, not that it stops us looking for the full continuation. The one line in the poem, you can start and follow straight to the end. The fixed belief you can hold facing a stranger that saves us the trouble of a real conversation. But one day, you're not just imagining an empty chair where your loved one sat. You're not just telling a story where the bridge is down and there's nowhere to cross. And you're not just trying to pray to a God you imagined would keep you safe. No, you've come to the place where nothing you've done will impress and nothing you can promise will avert the silent confrontation. The place where your body already seems to know the way, having kept to the last its own secret reconnaissance. But still, there is no path that goes all the way. One conversation leads to another, one breath to the next, until there's no breath at all. Just the inevitable final release of the burden. And then wouldn't your life have to start all over again for you to know even a little of who you've been? So what is this life? How do I make sense of it? This is it's like the basic spiritual question. This is the basic religious question. This is the question that Han Shan keeps pulling us back to. I was thinking about this poem today when I was reading an article in uh, National Geographic about uh, how marginal Molokai is. And why would anyone come here? This poem starts, go ahead, make fun of the way to Cool Mountain, where there's not a trace of horse or cart. It's hard to remember valley switchbacks below, below layer upon layer of so many peaks. 
do weeps on a thousand kinds of grasses, wind sing through the pine. Lost now on my path, shadow, tell me, which way should I go? Which way should I go? So this is the question that follows the first one of spiritual life. Now, what is this life? What is it about? And which way do I go? How do I live it? And when you're in solitude, you're on your own like Hanshan was, or even just in those moments. Like last night, I got up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and the moon was bright. I thought something was moving, but it was my shadow <laughs> across the floor. In solitude, you turn to the only one that's with you, your shadow, and ask, how shall I live? What should I do? What's the best life? What's really important? I think, of course, this is what Suzuki Roshi was asking when he would ask his students, what is your inmost request? What is that deepest thing that's calling us? Where does such a call come from and where does it lead us? And one of the things that I've been curious about uh, recently is we hear these calls that come, maybe in a dream, maybe in our quiet time of sitting, maybe it's when we're driving to work in the morning or sitting and having coffee, reading the paper or busy, busy taking care of kids or dinner, it's something. How do we know if this is our inmost request, meaning a deep, true voice, or is it some small part frightened and hoping to be protected or some other aspect. It's not that those voices are not to be listened to. It's really important that we do, but how do we know what we're hearing? We don't always, but that doesn't mean it's not important to listen. There is no ultimate truth in a world of impermanence and interdependence. Yet, there is no ultimate truth. This is what Nagarjuna is telling us. There is no ultimate truth in a world of impermanence and interdependence. Yet, wisdom is real. Compassionate and skillful means are possible. A wholesome life is receivable and expressible. There is no ultimate truth in a world of impermanence and interdependence, yet wisdom is real. And compassionate and skillful means are possible. And a wholesome life is receivable and expressible. Here's one more little bit that I wrote when I was doing my own exercise. Work as a psychotherapist and directing hospital-based programs for cancer patients and their families can be demanding. In my late 30s, having finished my PhD and set up my private practice, I finally allowed myself to take a vacation. Oddly, I had never taken off for two weeks in my life, and it was anxiety producing. I decided to go to Hawaii, hiking the beautiful and rugged Nepali Trail on the north coast of Hawaii, along with a friend. Along with the needed supplies to sustain us on our trek, I took along a copy of the Dhammapada, one of the earliest texts of the Buddha's collected teachings. The 11 mile hike along the narrow trail to our campsite was demanding, but the scenery was unbelievably inspiring. The combination of fear and awe as we navigated the narrow trails high above the ocean left me in a rare state as we finally reached the remote beach in the Kalawa Valley at the end of the trail. 
in that state, I began reading the unfamiliar words of this ancient Eastern teacher. Ordinary life had dropped away as I traversed the switchbacks to the hanging valleys along the jagged coast. As I walked, I was held up by the vast sky above me and called forward by this seemingly endless ocean reaching out to the horizon. Something true was being revealed to me in the raw power of nature. And more subtly on the pages of the slim volume I carried in my backpack. Here I was exposed to nature without much to prop me up or to fall back on no one to impress, and nothing to hide. I stood naked under the waterfall to take my shower, rested in the shade of the rainforest canopy to eat my meals, and took walks along the beach with the shorebirds scurrying along beside me as my companions. Poem number three. Amidst cliffs, I've made my home. The paths of birds are beyond human tracing. What is there beside my garden? White clouds embracing dark stone. How many years have I lived in this place, watching the many changes of winter and spring? Let me say to those with cauldrons and chimes, there's no merit in your worthless reputation. <laughs> on this ridge here now in Hawaii, I've made my home. I look in this valley that I just mentioned and I watch a morning and evening commute of flocks of white egrets. They come down through the valley in the morning. They come back in the afternoon. The paths of birds are beyond human tracing. What is there besides my garden? I have more than 50 palm trees. They produce a lot of biomass that I have to get rid of. White clouds embracing dark stone. I love that line because it's a beautiful line about the mountains and the, and the clouds, but really what it said to me after I read it the first few times is <clears throat> the goodness, whatever openness, whatever wakefulness I could possibly open to and practice embraces the darker parts of me, the hidden, naughty, difficult, thorny places, white clouds embracing dark stone. Does that make sense? How many years have I lived in this place, watching the many changes of winter and spring, on and on, year after year? Let me say to those with cauldrons and charms, with PhDs and, you know, on and on. I said to myself, there's no merit in your worthless reputation. And here's the completion of my writing on this one. When I returned from this trip, from when I did my hike on the Kala Trail, when I returned, I began to slowly find my way along a new spiritual path. This landscape was characterized by mindful awareness, profound acceptance, and deep gratitude for all it is. I studied and learned all I could about the Buddhist teachings. I came to see that his only concern was the cause of suffering and the relief of suffering he saw around him. That was what I was interested in, what my patients needed, relief from suffering. I meditated and went to retreats. I found mature teachers to guide me and friends to accompany me along the way. I started a small meditation group, founded a Zen center, was ordained as a priest, spent time in a training monastery and practice in Japan. Eventually, I allowed a good bit of the ancient Asian forms of practice to fall away. Now I teach the same freedom from suffering, just as I am in this body at this time, in this culture, under these circumstances. Poem four.
Joel, you want to read one? Yes. He was our first head student at Akamai. Number four, if you want to attain a peaceful life, settle down at Cold Mountain. Subtle breezes blow through mysterious pine. Listen closely. The sound is really good. Beneath it, someone with graying hair reads the Yellow Emperor and Lao Tzu without ceasing. After 10 years, I can never return. I've even forgotten the way I came. Well, what is this settling down at Cold Mountain? If you want to attain a peaceful life, does that mean you got to go to China and sit on the mountain? <laughs> Joel, I'm asking you, you're the reader. No clue. No clue. Good answer. I don't think he it means come to sit in the mountain with him. If you want to attain a peaceful life, settle down in Anshan's mind, the mind that is like yours, when there's no separation. Subtle breezes, subtle, um, subtle waves of care and attention and challenge, subtle waves move through our relationship, don't they, Joel? Listen. I'm, and I'm hearing the sound is really good. The subtle breeze is blowing through the mysterious pine. And these are pines that may be on the way up or maybe on Cold Mountain were singing without even the wind there. That's right. From the other poem, it reminds us. All right. Ah, we can hear this even without making a fuss. It's there. Someone with graying hair, I didn't choose you because of that. But. You know, you can read this stuff and study, and it's really, really good to do so. How, how long have you been practicing now? Uh, 16 years. Yeah. Even after 10 years, I can never return. I've forgotten the way I came. Something about that, isn't there? I see Annie shaking her head. Let's hear from her. What would you say about that one, Annie? You're, you're not okay now you're unmuted so um so much of this poetry is about being present where you are um and of of taking in what is there with you so i the i i i can't um look back on my life and there are parts where i remember it as another person you know, childhood, there are those experiences and then, you know, living one life and going through school and then how many lives have happened since then. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the way back, but it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Because this, this is the way now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorting out the way you came is not really that crucial, is it? It doesn't matter. But making practice a central part of one's life changes everything else. Mm -hmm. You can never return. There's no going back. How fortunate. Yes. And how irritating at certain times. <laughs> yes. But the causes and conditions that brought us where we all are today, even just to be on the screen together, uh, can seem like a blur. But we keep studying and we keep practicing and we keep listening to the subtle sounds of the mystery together. Number eight. Once I moved to Cold Mountain, everything was at rest. No more useless mixed up thinking. It's a little bit like you were pointing to Kim and the other poem. No more useless mixed up thinking. In idleness, I write poems on stone walls, accepting whatever happens like an untied boat. Like an untied boat. But Kathy, were you just boating? Canoeing? Yeah. You have to unmute yourself. 
I'll do it if you can't do it. Yes, I was. I was. I was what happened? Did you tie your boat up? <laughs> and we, uh, it was a great adventure. We wound up on Lake Michigan, which is kind of a, a big piece of water. That's and almost like an ocean. Yeah, yeah. And, and Kim had actually said at one point, you said to her to um, to get in touch with your smallness, mm -hmm. being held by this vast mm -hmm. sea of, of water. Yeah, and, and I remembered that. That was it was good. It was profound. It was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. No more useless mixed up thinking. Suzuki Roshi said, "When you are you." Buddha is Buddha. Can we discover who we really are? To find our place in the world and then occupy that place as just ourselves, to find our, our place. And the Genjo Koan, many of you remember, Dogen wrote, when you find your place where you are, he says, once I moved to Cold Mountain, everything was at rest. When you find your place where you are, practice occurs, actualizing the fundamental point. When you find your way at this moment, practice occurs, actualizing the fundamental point. For the place, the way, is neither large nor small, neither yours nor others. The place, the way, is not carried over from the past and is not merely arising now. Accordingly, in the practice enlightenment of the Buddha way, meaning one thing is mastering it. Doing one practice is practicing completely. Here is the place. Here the way unfolds. That just rang so powerfully for me as I was thinking about how do I understand Cole Mountain? How do I understand Hanshan? How do I understand this place? When we find our place where we are, practice occurs. Actualizing the fundamental point. What's the fundamental point? To realize and accept, release ourselves to our lives. Ex accepting whatever happens like an untied boat. There's another poem by Dogen, by the way, that you may not have heard. Here's the, here's the four line poem. Midnight on the lake, no wind, no waves. The empty boat is flooded with moonlight. It's such a peaceful image, isn't it? Midnight on the lake, no wind, no waves. The empty boat is flooded with moonlight. As we settle our body, and settle our hearts and settle our mind at least a bit. That space that's emptied can be flooded with the grace of, of awakening, flooded with moonlight. <laughs> On a very light note, I was in a retreat one time with Rev Anderson and a number of people from the Austin Zen Center, and Rev used this poem. And one of the very esteemed people that was with us didn't hear properly, and later said, I don't understand the poem about the goat in the moonlight. I thought he said goat, instead of boat. Let's see. Let's see. Let's go just a bit further. Number 41. Got it? Heaven created a tree 100 feet tall that could be cut into long, 
plates for lumber. What a pity this wood from a master carpenter was abandoned in a dark valley. Its heart remained strong after many years, but gradually its bark stripped off, leaving it bald. If there's someone who knows how to use it, it might make a strong post for a horse barn. You know, what is created, everything that is created is useful. But because we select and reject, things get abandoned, forgotten, turned away from, misunderstood, exiled, abandoned in a dark valley. Yet the heart remains strong for many years. If the heart is Buddha nature, your heart is that of awakening, then that heart is untouched by conditions and is present to be realized and released, appreciated and embodied without an end. Even with aging, maybe more importantly with aging, we are valuable, maybe more so if someone knows how to use the wisdom and compassion that comes with maturity, he can build a horse barn. So Joan Mueller, can you unmute yourself there? Or I'll do it for you here. Let's make it easy. Nope, I can't. Can you do it? If you can't, that's okay. I just want to see if you, there you did it. Let's hear your voice. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Would you, would you read number 45? I know we're right at the end of our time, but we'll, we'll cap it off. Here. Why are young people unhappy? They're sad to see old people's white hair. Why does white hair make them sad? They worry when they feel the pressure of time. But if they want to live on the eastern mountain of death or were appointed to guard northern cemetery, I can't bear to see these words. It would hurt old people to hear them. Isn't it interesting that 1,300 years ago he was writing about how unhappy young people are? If they could have only imagined the youth culture of today and the high rate of depression and anxiety among young people, compounded by the lack of friendship. And this is one of the things, Joan, you and I have talked about. It's what it's like to be, for sometimes, for you, the oldest one in the room. And to have so much to offer and try to find a way to offer it. Is this true? Well, as I sit here, I feel like I'm a beginner. That's one of the most important things you have to offer. On this mountain where there's so much that I don't know. Yeah. And how good it feels to be just open. Like I wish I could live a long time to catch up with what I don't know. That's a great line. That's so good. How old are you? 82. 82. Yeah, good enough. So to end, um, <clears throat> let's, do um, you have enough light to read there, Sally? No? Okay. We can get somebody else to do that. Mm -hmm. Hey, Nancy, would you read for us? What would you like me to read? Number, uh, we're going to go back to number 15. 15? Mm -hmm. Mm 
this may have a little poignancy for you, but. So if I cry, you don't mind? That's all right. Okay. <laughs> for those of you that do not know, Nancy just lost her husband, so Michael's really important. About six weeks ago. Yeah. Um, a country person mm -hmm. lives in a thatched roof hut. In front of his gate, a horse or a cart is rarely seen. Mm -hmm. Birds gather in the dark forest. The broad streams teem with fish. He takes his child to collect nuts and berries, mm -hmm. and together he and his wife plow the hilly field. Inside their hut, what do they possess? Only books on a single shelf. Yeah, after all this time, what, what remains? What do we really, what do we really possess? It's, it's hard, to, hard to know and it's confusing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. After downsizing and getting a smaller space and knowing the way things are going. But for those of you that don't have the Song of the Grassroot Hermitage, I'm gonna send it to you. It's a good poem um, to use in between this class and the next. And I'm gonna uh, just read one, one last thing uh, to come to an end, it's number 60. And this is about coming forward. Um, be able to step into your way. Cassie, would you read that one? There you go. Lost the book. <clears throat> if you remain silent and don't speak, what will your descendants say? If you hide in a forest or a bamboo grove, how will your wisdom shine through? A withered tree is not protected. Wind and frost cause disease. If you plow a gravel field with an ox, how will you ever harvest rice? <laughs> There's a lot in that one in there. Yeah. <laughs> that will leave us with uh, some questions for next time. Um, you know, practice in the world, offer yourself fully, Everything comes to an end. What are you going to plant, you know? And how are you going to make a field for it? So between now and next class, remember someone with whom you've walked through a particularly important part of your life. Write about that person, the situation. I'm going to send you these, these prompts so you don't have to remember how you were shaped. Suzuki Roshi's question, inmost request. What is your calling? And... Uh, you might even want to think about starting to write some poems back to Hanshan. Uh, Cassie and I are working on setting up something. Do you want to say what that is, Kath? Oh, um, we're going. We're making a. Uh, if if any of you are familiar with uh, using Google Documents or Google Drive, we're making a shared folder for the entire class where each person can uh, put their uh, page in and then be able to be read by everybody else, plus the shared documents or uh, any kind of shared chat of what we have. And um, if anybody needs assistance with getting that stuff working, I'll provide the assistance, the tech support to help make that work for us. And I'll give you her email address. Um, I have a question on the assignment. Is it, uh, um, what came up for me is um, a child I work with now. Yeah. So it, yeah. it didn't have to be like from our childhood. It can be just. Oh, anything. God, no. Okay. No, it sounds fantastic. And I apologize for going over a few minutes. Uh, we got a little late start. So, um, And by the way, what Cassie is suggesting isn't that anyone has to put anything anywhere. It's just a place in case you want to share things that we find and, and would, would add to our richness that that will be there. Thank you for this evening and thank you for your time. Yes, Joel. Did you want to say something? Uh, yes, I, I want to say I really appreciate the chance to see everybody's faces and reactions as we are participating. Uh, it's, and, and Peg and Kim and all the folks in the, mm. in the Zendo in Austin, uh, you're actually 
so far away that I can hardly distinguish your faces. It's a shame. But for yeah. the people on video, it's quite moving to me to be able to connect in this way. And I, I wanted to ask if it's possible for the folks who are going to be listening later, if there's some way to get their pictures so that we can see what they look like. Because I know. I'm oh, very yeah, we might, we might find a way to do that. That'd be good. Thank you for asking. Thank you for appreciating it. We will be signing off for this time. And I will stop our recording. And later, this recording will be available in some format, probably on those Google documents or something. We'll see. Uh, there'll be a link for it. Goodbye until next time. Keep walking. Yeah. <laughs>